speaker this morning, Carrie Hardy. Grew up around Rockland and Lincolnville. Um, spent a lot of time exploring, which is what kids used to do and a lot of kids are doing here today. And along the way, he started getting curious about what it was he was seeing, what he was finding, um, what happened here, why are things like they are. And I was lucky enough to hear Terry give a version of this talk about five years ago, where he kind of traced the historic foodways of New England, particularly of Maine. Um, there's now a book, and I'm really pleased and honored to welcome Terry Hardy to uh, come talk to us about the food that we have here before we really started farming in the, uh, the earliest farmers here in the state of Maine. Welcome, Terry. Show Christina. <laughs> and if any one of you has your eyes closed or has a goofy face on when the shutter snaps, we're going to do it again until we get it right. <laughs> yeah. And, and it is intimidating, a, uh, a crowd that requires three, uh, three different angles from the camera <laughs> is kind of scary. But. But I'm sure she'll see people she knows in these pictures. So thank you. Uh, if any of you need to sign a release before I can show these to her, let me get a hold of me after the after the talk. So I want to uh, I want to start talking today by thanking Mokka for, for hosting me, and in turn, thanking the Penobscot Nation for hosting Mokka on this nice piece of real estate that's, that's kind of theirs. But, um, you know, it's, uh, I'm, in a lot of ways, I'm not as interested in the past as I am in the future. Uh, I don't think of, I don't want to think of it as red mane and white mane. I want to work towards a nice pink mane uh, where we where we don't care about stuff like that. So, um, though I acknowledge that my family and a lot of others uh, wound up here as uninvited guests of the native people, um, that's that's behind us. I can't control that, but I can control what I do with my life, and I think we all can to to a greater or lesser degree. So that that's what I'm interested in working. I wanted to start by, uh, by giving a few of the reasons why uh, I like digging around in the past. A few years ago, um, it, it dawned on me slowly that uh, you can grow up in this state and uh, go to good schools and all of that and reach adulthood without having hardly heard anything about the people who lived here before Euro-American people lived here. Um, there's that little bit about the first Thanksgiving and all of that propaganda that we get, but really it was possible when I came through school to be very insulated from any, anything like a, a real telling of the story. And I found myself, because I spend a lot of time outdoors, and because I'm always interested in the way that people relate to their landscape, I, I just found myself needing to know more about what this place that we call Maine now looked like 500 years ago and, uh, and how the people related to it. And that really started me on a, uh, a fascinating path of, of study, exploration, and, and meeting new people. And, uh, sharing ideas with them. I want to go to the 
and usually when I'm uh, on one of those learning paths, uh, you can tell pretty easily because books like this, which are just blank, books full of blank pages, start accumulating on my shelf uh, as I fill them up with tidbits of information and start looking for the patterns. So by the time I had five or six of these books full of stuff that I thought was interesting, I started thinking maybe other people would find this interesting too. And that all culminated uh, with a uh, with a book that came out about a year ago called Notes on Lost Flute, which the folks at Downey's Publishing were kind enough to publish for me. And that book coming out has in turn opened a lot of interesting doors uh, and allowed me to meet new people and, and be exposed to new ideas. But here's, here's some of the reasons why uh, I found it interesting learning, trying to educate myself about Maine's native past. One thing um, that needs to happen is that we need to correct some of the uh, European mindsets or, or conceits or preconceptions um, that, that we've kind of inherited from the uh, from the first European ancestors who came here, um, you know, one of the one of the common things is is uh, new new arrivals in this country thought that the people were inferior in some way, whether because of their religious practices or their uh, the things that they knew and didn't know versus what Europeans knew and didn't know. Uh, but but that's that's common enough for uh, when you meet a new culture to think them inferior to you. All of the Wabanaki folks thought that too when the Europeans started showing up on the shore. And, was, and uh, you, you can read some fun some fun things where each side is kind of kind of uh, pitying of the other. Um, you know because the, the nat a lot of the natives were very convinced that the. Uh, the Europeans must be here because they had run out of firewood where they lived. That was a good reason to move. And it wasn't far from the truth if you if you think about what what uh, the British Isles were like, you know, in the year 1500. But anyway, um, so this idea that somehow culture here was inferior uh, is, is a European conceit that we can't help but have inherited uh, to a small degree. Uh, and I thought you know, everything I found out seemed to be pointing quite the opposite direction. Uh, another, another European misconception, I think, is, is, well, there aren't very many of them there. And of course, that plus the, uh, the, the thought that they were uh, godless people, uh, that combined with the low population was a good reason to sort of appropriate this place. And, and of course, the, uh, the reason that the population was low was because people living on this continent had no resistance to Eurasian diseases, which were showing up on our shores uh, regularly from 1500 on. So the population, uh, most, of the, most of the reading I've done indicates that the population along the uh, along the Maine and Massachusetts coast took about a 90 percent hit just from the epidemic of 1617 to 1619 which dovetailed quite nicely with a certain boat rolling ashore in 1620 and finding all sorts of empty cornfields uh, just waiting to be planted or grazed so the whole question of how many people were here, even today in, in uh, anthropological literature, I feel that the number is underrepresented routinely. Uh, anthropologists talk about human densities in Maine of one to two people per square mile. And if you've ever gone any place along the coast and tried feeding yourself, uh, or tried finding food, you, you very quickly learned that you could support 25 to 50 people per square mile quite easily. So that's, that's uh, just another idea that, that kind of needled at me and, and I wanted to learn, learn my way past that. Um, another European mindset was uh, that, that 
went along with the idea of thinking this culture inferior was that, uh, and, and sadly, you still see this word today. They are nomadic. They have no fixed abode. They wander. It's as though they wander around the landscape hoping to stumble over food. And that idea just has to be stomped on every time you ever encounter it. What they did was, was selectively move over the landscape to get what they needed. But they had multiple fixed abodes. You know, nowadays, if you uh, if you live most of the time in Bangor, and some are on Vinyl Haven, and happen to have a hunting or fishing camp up on Moosehead, we would call you a doctor or a lawyer. But in 1600, you, you just would have been one of the people. <laughs> uh, because that's, that's how people kind of live. There was a time of year to be at, at uh, one place, and a time of year to be at another. And I'll talk more about that later. But anyway, getting past this idea uh, that, that people were somehow inferior because they didn't have uh, rectangular two-story buildings with concrete foundations was, was uh, something I spent a lot of time on. My ultimate goal uh, in digging this stuff up is, is to know these people better, to know their past better, to know the state's natural history past better, and to uh, you know to, to help us uh, help us move towards an understanding and an open acknowledgement of about four centuries of injustice, both both to the people and the landscape here, um, because it it does feel good once you kind of come to grips with that and and acknowledge uh, what what has gone on in, in Maine and New England over the last four hundred years. But I also are very interested in the fact that they had more sustainable life ways in a lot of ways than, than the way we live now. And I want to examine them and see which of those we can use to help us move forward. And as I kind of hinted earlier, my final uh, interest is in having a more integrated society in this state where where we have common goals like sustainability and education and equal opportunity, and that's a whole lot more than the color of your skin or who your ancestors were. So I'm, uh, I'm going to dive in now and, and talk about some nuts and bolts of the, uh, of the way the food year went. The, uh, the basic the basic premise of what I'm, I'm looking at is this. Uh, there's been a lot of fanfare in the last decade or so about the 100-mile diet. It's kind of a trendy thing to, uh, to say, I'm going on the 100-mile diet. And, and it is a good thing. There's no, I'm not mocking it. Uh, but it's worth pointing out that four or 500 years ago, everybody in this state was on that 100-mile diet and living quite nicely. Uh, nobody. Nobody was starving. Um, you will only rarely find occasions where, during the time of year when uh, people were the farthest out in the woods during the January, February, March uh, moose hunting phase of the year, uh, if the weather didn't cooperate, and if the snow wasn't deep enough for you to run moose down on your snowshoes or for your dogs to run on top of it, then you could you could get hungry, and there was very occasional starvation. But in general, um, they had all the food they wanted and needed, from what I've learned. Um, so, given that the hundred mile diet worked great four or five hundred years ago, uh, what exactly did they eat, and how is that knowledge useful to us going forward? Uh, how, how can we apply it today and in the future? So that's what I'm going to be talking about specifically today. And when I talk about these old food ways, my goal is never, uh, you know, to just slavishly recreate the past. It's uh, it's it's to say let's take let's uh, let's borrow some of these ideas uh, as our European ancestors did. Uh, and really make them part of our food ways. Uh, 
and, and add them to some of the other wonderful sustainable food things that we can do. The, uh, as I get older, the concept that I keep coming back to as a useful one in life is evolution, not revolution. And I'm not looking to turn the clock back to that point in time. I am looking to kind of drift towards a bit more sensible uh, approach to our food. Uh, in, in doing my research and, uh, and writing my book, uh, my, my educational background was a big part of it. I was saying to Russ before the talk, somebody was asking me to, to give a little speaker bio at another conference I did recently, and uh, I said, I don't, it's hard to do because I spent most of my life walking the ridge lines that separate different bodies of knowledge. I haven't really camped out in any one for too long because uh, when you do get up on the on the cusp between two areas or on a ridge, uh, the view is pretty good. You can see things either way, and uh, I guess I guess that gets us towards something that you might call cross-disciplinary learning, study. And uh, I've talked about this uh, quite a quite a bit with Baron Heinrich. We get together for a fair amount of deer hunting and uh, just hanging out at his camp every year. And uh, we were talking about this, this uh, at one point, and, and he just kind of tipped back and smiled. And he said, yeah, there's a lot of low-hanging fruit when you're, uh, when you're walking a path 90 degrees to the way everyone else is traveling. And it's quite true. You see things uh, that have missed. And I like to think of it as a lattice of knowledge. We have our different disciplines, archaeology, ethnography, biology, uh, ecology, whatever you want. But the pressure academically these days is for vertical learning. You stay in your field and you climb up that ladder as far as you can. And if you don't have, uh, every so often, dubs like me walking across at 90 degrees to these tall vertical pillars, and doing some stitching, uh, you can get in a very precarious position. So uh, that's, that's the way I like to think of it. Vertical knowledge is good to go very deep on a subject and learn all you can. Horizontal knowledge is good because, uh, well, here's a good example. Well, the, uh, the people who lived in northwestern Maine, they, they call them the loop people, the loop being the French word for wolf. Uh, they, were, they were close kin to the Mohicans on the Hudson. Uh, they had a word for a peregrine falcon, and it looked to me like it translated to be widow bird. And after thinking about it uh, for a while, it finally made sense to me, because the peregrine falcon has dark stripes on its cheeks. And if you study uh, Wabanaki culture, you learn that widows, uh, after their husband died, would take soot and blacken their cheeks for a period of about a year. And then after the official mourning was over, they would take the red paint and paint their cheeks red, which symbolized that probably that they were back in the market. I don't know what it, exactly what it symbolized. but So anyway, I got thinking, uh, we, don't, we don't teach our biologists anything about the Wabanaki languages, so Generally, biologists wouldn't be the one to solve this riddle. But we don't teach ethnographers what peregrine falcons look like either. So the whole question of uh, the significance of that translation, why is this hawk called the widow bird, uh, it only comes if you're combining disciplines. And that's, uh, that's what a lot of the stuff that I try to do, uh, it seems to be leading me across disciplines rather than up and down them. Okay, so here's, uh, here's what everything that I've been able to find uh, about where people live, live uh, and everything I've heard uh, talking to as many people as I can about it suggests that there were uh, at least three main places you would find yourself in the year here. And I'll call one of them Main Village, um, which is usually some point on the main stem of a river where there's very good fishing, 
both during the spring run of anagramus fish and during the fall run of eels, which is going on right now. The ability to trap a whole bunch of protein with very little effort and then preserve it by air drying, sun drying, smoke drying, uh, whatever, uh, made these very attractive locations. Uh, in addition to which, if you felt the urge to travel, if you're on the main stem of a river and you have a birch canoe, you can do a lot of traveling. So both in the uh, May to June portion of the year, and then again at harvest time, uh, right, right now is we're getting towards the peak of the eel run, uh, these are both good times to be at what I'll call main, main village locations. Uh, I'm, I'm having a lot of fun right now working with a guy named Doug Watts, who some of you may know lives in Augusta and has probably done more to restore the, uh, the rights of an adramus fish in Maine to actually get up river and spawn than, than anyone else I know. But Doug and I have been going around uh, the central part of the state looking for stone weirs because if you can find, or the remnants of stone fish weirs, because if you can find the weirs, you can pretty much put a dot on the map and say, this was a place where a lot of people came together. And as you start doing that and getting dots around the state, you start to have a map of, you know, 1,500 or, or, uh, or three or 4,000 years ago. Uh, and, uh, I like the way Doug put it at a conference we spoke at last week. He said, uh, you know, because you want to get people enthused about it, and you show them a, a picture that's a, a slide of a pile of rocks in a river. But if instead of calling them a pile of rocks, you, uh, you describe them as the oldest existing man-made structures in New England, older than the pyramids in Egypt, by the way, um, then you start seeing them in a different light. And when you realize that for decades, centuries, millennia, these weirs marked important places of human habitation, um, you start getting excited about, oh, we should know where these are, we should take care of them. Maybe we should even keep archeologists from pulling them apart and digging there. Um, but we should definitely find out where they are. You can, you can do this by combining a lot of disciplines, or sometimes you can do something as, as easy as talking to a Penobscot. <laughs> because when I was telling Butch Phillips about some of our discoveries, he was like, yeah, this one of them wants to blow us, this one of them at that in Wisconsin, this one is pass a dumb keg. And, uh, and so that, that, if anything, makes it even more interesting to me. I think it's even cooler that these oldest structures in New England, some of them probably have been continuously maintained and are still in use today. Um, you know, that's that's four or five, six thousand years of human history on a spot that's still going on. So that's that's been a fun project that I have been working on. Besides the uh, besides these main village sites where you would come in, in the spring and, and uh, do your planting and then in the fall for harvest and for all the fish you could get, there would be a period spent at the seashore in the summer. And that, if you've ever if you've ever been fortunate enough to uh, you know to just kind of hang out at the seashore in Maine in the summer, it's kind of a no-brainer, you know. To, the breeze keeps the bugs away. There's all the there's all the seafood you can eat, and uh, the weather's pretty nice. And uh, there's no reason not to be there for heaven's sake, you know. So uh, moving to the seashore, though I don't believe it was a whole scale thing, because as uh, as my friend Albie Barton told me, you cannot plant corn or or plants in general and then pick up and move away from them. They resent it. They won't grow as well for you. This isn't just about weeds. Uh, it's, about, uh, it's about the contract between a human being and the plant he's growing. And uh, so I don't, I don't think these main village planting sites were ever really abandoned. 
but you could keep a few people there, some of the older people who travel was a hardship for, and still keep the pests out of the corn and, and sing to it every day or whatever it needed. Um, but, but a lot of folks would find their way to the seashore. Uh, and there's plenty of archaeological evidence of people spending time along the coast in the summer. And at, at various times of year, actually, depending on how far back you go. Because uh, wherever you have clams and mussels, you can always find a meal, right? Uh, you may get sick to death of them, but, uh, but you, you won't go hungry. Uh, so so the, the seashore was very important. And I'll talk more about that when I talk about specific food. And then I've already mentioned the, the third place to be, and that is the uh, interior hunting camp. Basically, when the snow would get deep enough uh, towards end of January, start of February, there were, there were two things you were interested in. One was uh, going where the snow was deep enough so you could run down a moose, and, and moose were usually killed uh, by a handheld spear. There was no need to waste an arrow. After you had run a moose to exhaustion in deep snow and your dogs were holding it at bay, or even if there weren't dogs, um, it was fairly easy to finish it off with a spear. And ironically, for the moose anyway, the, uh, the business end of the spear was very often made from the shoulder blade of a moose. Uh, happens to, happens to, to be a pretty good thing to make a spear, spearhead with. Um, and, uh, you know, it's just a, a fairly easy thing to do if you found the track and the snow was deep enough, you could eat moose. But the other reason you went to the interior was uh, for sugar maples. Uh, once, once the st sap started flowing, uh, you know, March, in March, uh, there's, there's no question in my mind, occasionally you will see somebody uh, having the nerve to suggest that Europeans taught Native Americans to make sugar from, from maple trees. <laughs> I, uh, I have read these things and I have never seen anything that convinced me that it wasn't the other way around. Uh, whether, I mean, there, there are oral, oral histories among many different Native American groups about red squirrel teaching them about making maple syrup. Has anyone heard that story? Uh, if you watch red squirrels in March, they will nip the branches off sugar maples, and then they'll come back the following morning and eat the icicles. Uh, you know, I talked with Barrett about that, and he, he actually told me he submitted a piece to Nature magazine because he just thought it was such a cool squirrel behavior, the way they uh, would make these sap icicles and come harvest them the next day. And uh, the editor disagreed, and that one never got published instead. But it is cool and it's utterly believable to me that that's how, you know, just through nature observation, the first people here who started sugaring learned to do it. Wound the tree, the sap comes out, hey, it tastes good. Uh, so that was the other reason you wanted to be in the interior uh, as winter reached its peak and then started changing to spring. Okay, so given that, uh, and you know, if, if, if you hunt and fish, um, you, you know how to read the time for these different seasons, too. And if your life depended on it, as it did for these people, you probably got a lot better at reading it. So I suspect that within a day or two of the peak of the Elwife run, uh, as soon as the snow was ripe for moose hunting, within a day or two of the eel run uh, getting significant, people would show up at the right place, you know, at the right time. It's just, it's just outdoor learning that comes to you if you, uh, if you live this way. And, uh, and, and so, so the, the movement around the landscape, I'm going to talk now about what you are looking for. Um, it can be incredibly complicated if you, if you make a big deal about every food that people ate. A study of uh, Canadian indigenous people uh, showed 550 different plant species that were utilized as food one way or another. 
and of those 550 species, they identified 680 different food products. Um, and that was showing up in everything from teas uh, that you made of different plants to actual consumption of fruits, berries, nuts, or the green parts of plants. But the, uh, the diversity implicit in that statement uh, suggests that uh, we'll have our hands full recreating all the different ways that people have been learning about all the different ways people utilize plants. Uh, but even more important than, than plants, I suspect, were, were three things, and that being proteins, fats, and complex carbohydrates. And that's, uh, that's, that's kind of the, the meat and potato uh, of, the, uh, of the whole thing. And so I'll, I'll look at that a little bit. Um, when you look at different protein sources, Maine's pretty blessed. Uh, basically anything that, that runs, swims, or flies is, is a pretty good source of protein. And when you actually start cutting it up, lean meat from a variety of wild creatures will have about 20 grams per hundred of uh, protein. And the fat will vary widely. So for instance, on the, uh, I started looking at foods from a protein point of view. The, uh, the low end of the scale, let's see, coming in at 17, 17 grams per hundred uh, are herring, and uh, mackerel are at 19 grams per hundred. Salmon are a little better, 20 per hundred. Sturgeon were 21 grams per hundred. Venison, like tail deer, uh, moose meat is uh, about 22 grams per hundred. Tuna, tuna is 25 grams per hundred of protein. Lobster and wild turkey come in at 27 grams per hundred. And uh, I bet there would be some guessing before people got the, uh, the, the number one on the, on the top 10 protein list. But it's, uh, it's something that's trying to find its way to the Sargasso Sea right now in this state. And uh, instead of finding its way, it, it's uh, running through dam turbines, unfortunately. So yeah, American eel. American eel came in at 29 grams per hundred of protein. And I truly believe eel was the most important single food. The reason why is this, not just because it was a protein bomb, because of its configuration, long and skinny, very easy to dry it and preserve it. And on top of that all, the skin made great rope. You know, a piece of eel skin three feet long, perfect little twist tie to have around the camp. Um, it was just a very useful creature. Um, delicious to eat fresh. Um, but here's the, here's the real kicker with eel. It runs just as winter is coming on when you need to fortify yourself if you're living in the ambient temperatures that we have in this state. Eel supplied fat. Not only was it the richest in protein, it was the richest in fat. You would get 18 grams per hundred of fat from eels versus that lobster, which is almost as good a protein source was 1.3 grams of fat per hundred. Uh, tuna was a good fat source. That was 8 grams per hundred. Salmon was 12 grams per hundred. Herring were 13 grams per hundred. And these things all are way richer in oil than things like venison or uh, land-based protein. So the importance of fish, and particularly the importance of eels, um, coming in at the top of both the fat and the protein list, swarming down the rivers in just uncountable numbers at a time of near year when you needed to be putting on fat, uh, and in a form that you could keep and eat until the end of January when the snow was deep enough that you could go moose hunting made eel pretty much the perfect food and the most important food, I believe.
in terms of where your carbohydrates came from, one very important uh, source, you know, when you're a kid, you, you, uh, the, the joke about wild food is always eating roots and berries. And, uh, you know, when you're a kid and you hear about eating roots, you, you picture holding up a piece of wood like an ear of corn and gnawing on it. But, but the roots we're interested in uh, are the way a lot of plants in this part of the world grow. It's how they live. They're a food factory all summer, and by this time of year, all the good stuff, all the surplus that they've been able to generate gets stored in a fleshy root. So whether you're talking about ground nut, which, uh, which is a delicious wild food, or the bulb of the can of the lily, which grows about gay tall, uh, and has a baseball-sized bulb at the bottom of it that's full of sugar and carbohydrates, uh, whether it's an aquatic root like arrowhead, all of these, and, and even tiny little edible roots like you get from uh, the, the wildflowers like trout lily, or the one called Indian cucumber. All of these are where your carbohydrates uh, and, and sugars are going to come from. And it was important to know where they grew. I, uh, you remember that scene in the movie Scarface where Al Pacino said, say hello to my little friend. I brought, I brought a little friend with me. This is uh, for, the, for the few people who maybe don't know the plant uh, or have seen it along roadside and wondered. It's Jerusalem artichoke. And this is, uh, this is the variety that Fedco uh, sells. It's a really good, tall, robust variety. And it's uh, the, the carbohydrate storage on Jerusalem artichoke is in, uh, is in a little bulk. You can come up afterwards and see them. They're floating around in the bottom of the bucket. But when, when Father Raoul was living with the Norwich Walk people, back around 1720, their word for it was banach. The ach means a plural, that's, that's just how you made something plural, and the bun means edible root of any kind. So some sources will say, no, 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 banach is what they call ground nut, and others will say, no, the Jerusalem artichoke or lilies, but it was all of those. And banach in general were known to be good food sources. So, so you had to know where wood lily grew, like in old, old blueberry fields, uh, burn land, that's where you find wood lily, and the lily you found along streams. And uh, it's a plant we don't see now, but 500 years ago, it was seen, uh, probably transported, probably cultivated. One last source of uh, protein, fat, and carbohydrates that I'll mention are nut trees. Um, we think a lot of people in recent years, thanks to the uh, thanks to the work of people like Wells Thurber and the American Chestnut Foundation's main chapter, have actually been able to eat American chestnut again, and that's quite a quite a thrill for me to be able to do that. That was. Uh, that was the king of nuts if you had it. But I don't think it ranged much farther than the middle of the state. Uh, but we had a lot of other good edible nuts too. Most of us when we were kids have tried eating uh, red oak acorns. And that's, uh, that's something that's worth trying once. But if you, if you really want them to be palatable, there's a fair amount of uh, tannin that you'd have to leach out of them. And I understand there's a talk at the fair this year about making acorn flour, and I really want to go to that. But even though red oak is the commonest oak, and has probably the bitterest acorns, there were other oaks, white oak and bur oak, that had really quite palatable acorns. If you live between Waterville and Newport, you're in a part of the state along the Sebastopol River Valley where Far north of its normal range in this country, there is a ton of burr oak. And I am utterly convinced that human transport is the reason that we have so much burr oak in the central part of the state. It's also where the best alewives run were in the state along the Sebastopol River. And I really think it was a, a seat of a lot of people. Um, so burr oak has traveled all up and down the Sebastopol River 
shouldn't be there, but there it is. Same thing uh, they found looking at ground nut on the St. John River. Someone actually did a chromosome count on it, and lo and behold, the uh, the version of ground nut that grows along the St. John River is it is is triploid. It's not okay. It's not the normal. So here again, and then the nearest population like that was in Pennsylvania. So here again, we have a real good case for human transport uh, being involved. Russ, Russ has, has kindly just given me the, uh, the ten fingers in the air, which uh, is a sure sign that I'm a third of the way through my talk. <laughs> and uh, have some condensing to do. But uh, I, think, I think that's all I'll say about the specific foods. Uh, almost anything was food, but if you want to reconstruct a map of ancient Maine, you sort of have to study which ones were the ones that really counted, and, and that's where you can put the dots and, and start connecting where people live. So, what I think, what I think it's incumbent on us to do now, um, in terms of what we can take from this diet and move forward with, um, you know the. If, if you think to the old rule of thumb about everything we do should be for the benefit of seven generations down, that's kind of a convenient number because let's start with American Eel. They are on something called the IUCN Red List. The IUCN, I think, is the International Union for the Conservation of Nature. American Eels and Eels in general, European too, are rated as critically endangered. The next the next uh, class beyond that is extinct in the wild, and they're edging their way towards it. We have not taken care of eels in this state. Neither have we taken care of things like alewives and shad. And uh, this is just an example of why I think, uh, as with so many things in this day and age, it's kind of up to us at the grassroots level to start taking these things back. The anadromous fish in this state, uh, since 1735, all through New England, there have been laws requiring any dam that is built have passage, safe passage, and effective passage for anadromous fish. Since 1735, corporate interests and the governors they've owned and the commissioners that those governors have owned have failed to enforce the law. Every dam that's built where an anadromous fish once lived in this state that doesn't have a working fishway is an illegal dam. And since 1820, so what's that? We're uh, coming up on 190 years now. We have not had an executive branch in this state that has seen fit to enforce the laws already on the books protecting these fish that that are the common property. Uh, there are people working to try and get this passage, uh, but the help is not coming from our legislature, and it's not coming from our executive branch. And if you want to know where to lay the blame for the disappearance, not just of these river fish, but the fish in the Gulf of Maine, like cod and haddock, that eat these fish, uh, the, the front doormat at the Blaine House would be a good place to start. And I would include our current administration uh, as equally culpable with all the ones that have preceded it. But I, I really think it's up to us to start uh, making a lot of noise about getting these fish back in our rivers and getting fish back in the Gulf of Maine. And alewives and eels are the two most important pieces of that puzzle. Other thing I would like to see us do is to um, uh, work, work so that native food species, whether they be plant, animal, maybe something in between, if there is such a thing. Oh, 
are identified and receive uh, enough oversight and recognition as being common property that we pass laws to take care of them. They aren't all in danger, uh, but some of them are. And I think that would be a good litmus test. If this is a native food species, several things should happen. Uh, it should be free from genetic contamination. And surprise, corn is a native food species. <laughs> so that would be a good place to start, saying native food species, uh, we should not be able to grow genetically modified versions of, the, the, of them in the state for fear of contamination. Uh, we should encourage our universities, even though there's no money in it coming from big corporations, we should encourage them to keep developing cultivars of native species. This uh, Jerusalem artichoke is a great example of that. Um, just a little bit of selective breeding and you can come up with, well, I don't care if it's a shagbark hickory tree, which is a great food plant, Jerusalem artichoke, um, a little bit of selective breeding, you can come up with, with good disease-free cultivars, and I would love to see our universities focus on native food, food species like this. Um, okay, I think the best thing for me to say at this point is that I do love talking about this stuff. I'm going to be around the fair all day today and all day tomorrow, and I really invite anyone who wants to uh, to come up and chat. I'll, I'll keep this silly hat on just so people can find me in the crowd uh, for the next couple of days. And uh, I would love to talk to anybody more about this stuff. Uh, and the last thing I would, I would close with is to say, to re remind people that we only protect that which we cherish. So if you want to see change, you know, it starts, it starts here and it starts here, right? So you have to find a way to connect yourself to these native foods. And I don't care if you go out and hunt a deer or plant some old varieties of corn, um, go to Dan Riscotta and watch the alewives run, go collect some hickory nuts in uh, Woolwich, go uh, pick some wild blueberries and take people with you. But however you do it, uh, get in the habit of, of trying native foods and increasing them in your diet. Get in the habit of thanking the boots for giving themselves to you and thanking the earth for growing them for you. And, and really work on cultivating the way that you personally uh, shepherd and cherish these foods. And if enough of us do that, we will quickly reach a tipping point where it just becomes the way the others in society do it. Tipping points don't come at 51% of the population, right? They come at about 10, 11, 12% of the population doing things a new way. So if everybody listening today uh, just cultivates this in themselves and in their circle of relations and friends, I think we will reach some fun tipping points and start taking care of this food. Okay, thank you very much for coming, and I'll see you at the fair. Have a good time. So, one of the really big challenges is Harry has enough to talk to teach us for several days. Um, he is scheduled tomorrow in the whole life tent. He's here. Carrie's book is over here, and 